Please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. Our scripture this morning comes out of the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 29, beginning at verse 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill you to my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, pour out Your Spirit upon this, Your Word, and make it be for us the Word of life, that we might be people of life. And now, O God, hide me behind the cross, that Your message of love and grace might shine through for the redemption of the world Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So 16 months ago, I did something that I had not done in 35 years. Think back what was happening 16 months ago. I know for many of us it seems like it was 16 years ago instead of 16 months But it was just a few weeks into the pandemic, and things were beginning to to shut down, one thing after another after another. And so I did something 16 months ago that I had not done in 35 years. I put together a jigsaw puzzle. (laughs) I hadn't done that since since I was a teenager. Early on in the pandemic, we were able to go by my parents' house out on the farm, and we stopped by and visited with them. And already, just a couple of weeks into the pandemic, we felt like we had watched all of Netflix. There was no more Netflix for us to watch. We had watched The Lion King. We had watched The Crown. We had watched Downton Abbey. We had watched watched it all, and we were bored to tears. So we came up with a great plan that we would that we would put together a jigsaw puzzle. My mother has put together jigsaw puzzles all of my life. Always during uh, times of Christmas and Thanksgiving, there was always a jigsaw puzzle laying out, and she would be putting it together slowly but surely. So we got a couple of jigsaw puzzles from my mom. And we started putting them together. We, we got one that was 250 pieces, which was, which was pretty simple, but it was a, it was a good way to start. And we, we got another one that was 500 pieces, and we finally got one that was seven, 700 pieces, and we began to put those puzzles together. Recently, I found out about a puzzle that, um, well, it's a puzzle maker that, that charges a whole lot for their puzzles. Uh, the, the, the number of pieces uh, number in the thousands, tens of thousands even, of these puzzles, and they are all handcrafted puzzles. They're hand cut out. And so uh, some of these puzzles cost upwards of four or five thousand dollars. It's a small company that, that produces just a couple of puzzles per year. In fact, they have one puzzle that they released just a few years ago that they have, re- they have offered a $10,000 reward if anyone could put the puzzle together. They have not had anyone succeed up to this point. Why? Well, you know, when you go to Walmart or when you go to Hobby Lobby or you go wherever and you buy your puzzle... The biggest help to putting a puzzle is that you've got the picture on the box. (laughs) And so you know what it is that you're putting together. Well, these puzzles, there is no picture on the box. You have no idea what you're putting together, and all of these shapes and all of these all of these shapes and sizes are are difficult to put to put together. Life sometimes can seem like a puzzle. In the front of your bulletin, attached to your bulletin, you'll notice likely that you have a puzzle piece. And so I would encourage you to, uh, to think about th- taking that puzzle piece home today and as, as we ponder what, what God's message is for each and every one of us today. Life sometimes feels like a, a, sometimes feels like a puzzle. Many of us approach life like it was a math problem. 
2 plus 2 equals 4, and so we just go logically throughout our lives. Things always make sense, but, but there's always something to, to figure out. What I, what I found, though, is life is more, it's more like a puzzle. I mean, we've got the, I mean, those of you who put together puzzles, I mean, the first thing after you, after you, after you dump the puzzle out of the box, you obviously start looking at the picture to figure out what you have, and then you start turning over all of those pieces. But I can promise you, if you're like most people, you will pick out the, what do you pick out first? The corner pieces. That's right. You pick out those corner pieces, those, those corner pieces that are like the, they're like the foundation of the puzzle. And life is like that as well. As we, as we begin to grow up and, and grow a little bit older, there are those foundational corner pieces in our lives. Foundational corner pieces like family and career and hobbies and, and maybe even faith fits in there somehow. And so we have those corner pieces and then begin, we begin to fill in the edges and, and we begin to make those connections between, between family and faith and, and, and faith and career and career and hobbies. And, and then finally we begin to, we begin to fill in the rest, the rest of the puzzle. There are, there are some pieces of the puzzle, some sections of the puzzle that come, to be, to come, come together very, very easily. There are other sections of the puzzle that are very difficult to put together. It's, it's, it's hard sometimes to determine different shades of green, whether it's, whether it's grass or whether it's trees or whether it's the roof of, of that house that's in that picture. And so sometimes those pieces of our puzzle don't seem to quite fit. The last puzzle that we did during the pandemic was a 750-piece puzzle. Not a huge puzzle, but enough for us beginners like we were. It was a Thomas Kincaid painting. You know those Thomas Kincaid paintings. They are always of some quaint little village or quaint little hut that is, that is tucked away in a forest somehow. Lots of muted greens and lots of muted browns. There may be a stream or a, a road, that, that, a pathway that, that, leads up, that leads up to that small little cottage. And so there we were. We started putting it together. We became obsessed with this very difficult puzzle for us. In fact, during, the, during those early days of the pandemic, as we were putting together this puzzle, my wife and I were taking turns. And so sometimes she would, she would get to the point that she was just so frustrated, she couldn't continue on, and I would take over. And sometimes we would stay up late into the night. I would be exhausted and finally collapse into bed, but she couldn't give it up. Do you, do you know those kinds of days? That you think, oh, just I'll find one more piece to go in there. And that one piece turns into a section, and that section turns into a larger section of the puzzle. And so one day we finally were nearing the end of this puzzle. We, were, we frantically re- realized we had about 15 or 20 pieces, only 15 or 20 pieces left in the puzzle. And that's when it gets fun, doesn't it? Because they're so easy to put in. And we finally, finally got to the very last, and we realized... There was one piece that was missing. <laughs> oh my. I called my mom and said, How could you give us a puzzle where there was a piece missing? She said, I promise all of the pieces were there when, when I gave it to you. And so we left it there on the table for a few days. And sure enough, sure enough, somehow, some way, whether it got tucked into an item of clothing or whatever, we found it in uh, between. Uh, b- well, right there in the couch, right there in the crease of the couch. I have no idea how, how, how it got there, but we finally completed, completed that puzzle. Every single piece is necessary. Every single piece of the puzzle is absolutely necessary. And again, I believe that there's, there's some connections between life and and, and this puzzle. See, every, every single piece of our lives is necessary. In fact, I would even go on to say that every one of us is necessary as well. Why does every piece matter? Because I believe that God has a plan for each one of us. God has a plan for each one of us. We come to our Scripture today, and, and many of us are very, very familiar with this passage of Scripture. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. We have it taped up in our mirror in the bathroom, or we have it on a magnet on our refrigerator. Some of us have it even even underlined in, in our own Bibles. For I know the plans I have for you. 
declares the Lord. Plans for welcome, or plans for welfare and, and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. This was an important message for the life of the Hebrew people. For you see, in the, in the book of Jeremiah, it's a difficult book to read. It's one of the, one of the most, in my, in my mind anyway, one of the most difficult books in the, New, in the Old Testament to read, partly because it's not arranged in chronological order. It's all out of order, but for the first 29 chapters, the first 29 chapters of the book of Jeremiah, we find that the Hebrew people are, are in exile in Babylon. They have turned their back upon God. They have rebelled. They have begun to worship other gods, and they have rebelled against the one God. And so God punished them. He sent them into exile in Babylon. And so over the first 29 chapters, we find God's pronouncement of judgment upon the Hebrew people. Beginning at, at chapter 30, we have, we have further uh, judgments pronounced upon the Hebrew people. And then at the end of the book, we have God's judgment upon all of the nations of, of the world. It's a tough book to read. It's a tough book to read because it, it, it's full of, it seems like despair and de- despondency. Where in the world are these people ever going to turn? But here, tucked right here in the, almost exactly in the middle of this book, we have, we have these beautiful words, but I have plans for you. No matter what you're going through, no matter where you are, you may feel like you are in exile in a foreign country, but I have plans for you, plans to prosper you, hope, grace, salvation. God has a plan for each one of us. Last week, I shared with you that I was the, I'm the youngest of five children. And I was a good kid, no doubt. I was a good kid. And so um, we were raised in the Leedy Methodist Church. Again, there was, there was no other Methodist Church in Leedy. We weren't the first Methodist Church of Leedy. We were the Leedy Methodist Church. There was only one. And so um, I had thought, I had thought really that I would probably come back to the farm because my dad is the youngest of six kids. And so when he, be- he became of age, when he got married, he, he uh, bought part of the farm from his dad, and he really just took over the family farm. He was the youngest of six. I was the youngest of five, and so that was naturally what I also was going to be doing. But as I, gave, but as I grew a bit and got into my later teenage years, I, I wasn't quite sure I wanted to come back to the farm. And so I thought about other kinds of things that I wanted to do. I knew this. I knew this. I wanted to make a difference. I absolutely wanted to make a difference. So I thought about maybe being a teacher. I thought about a medical profession. I I wanted to make a difference in the lives of others. Oh, I forgot to tell you, when I was 12 years old, I preached my first sermon. (laughs) 12 years old. I was the youngest in the youth group, and it came time for um, Youth Sunday. And I was the youngest in the youth group, and, and all, so the youth pastor asked, so who's going to be preaching for us this year on Youth Sunday? And the, the older members of the youth group, they said, not, not me. And each one of them, one by one, they all said, no, not me, not me. And they finally looked at me, the quietest, shyest, smallest, youngest kid in the youth group, and said, Leslie, you'll preach. <laughs> and so there I was that scrawny little awkward shy quiet little boy 12 years old I preached my first Sunday or I preached my first sermon and after that after that for some reason God blessed those people at the leading Methodist church for some reason the the preacher would ask me to preach whenever he went on vacation we were part of a two-point charge uh, the pa- our pastor, pastored, he was the pastor of two different churches, and so the church up the road in Camargo, Oklahoma, uh, they off, they, I would also not only preach at my home church, but I would also preach at the church in Camargo. The church in Camargo was a wonderful, small little congregation, congregation of five people, one of which was my grandmother. 
throughout the next couple of years, I had the opportunity to preach at a number of different churches, even country churches, churches there in town of different denominations. They would call me and ask me if their preacher was out on, uh, out on vacation or was, was sick sometime, and they would, they would call me to preach. It had never entered into my mind that God had something else for me other than, other than to be a farmer. We were having a revival the spring semester of my senior year, and the preacher began to, young pastor, very successful pastor, began to, he began to tell his story about how he felt like he had been called to ministry when he was a teenager. He too had had the opportunity to preach at an early age. He too wanted to make a difference, and he told about the call of God upon his life and how he experienced that call. And at that moment, right then, I knew that I knew that I knew that God was calling me to be a pastor. It had never, ever entered into my mind before. I, I, I've, I've said before, and I, I hesitate to say this because I know we're broadcast in many different areas, there weren't too many preachers that I had been around that I wanted to be like. And so I felt like I didn't have a role model. I didn't, I didn't know what it I had no idea what it was to be a pastor. But I went forward to the altar, altar call that night and And God called me to be a pastor. You see, that night I I experienced that God had a plan for my life. And what I have found is so often that when God has a plan for our life, when God has a calling upon our lives, and by the way, I think God has a calling on every single person in the sound of my voice. Those who are joining online or those who are sitting at home watching on television, I believe that God has a plan for your life. God has a calling upon every one of our lives. And I've also found that the primary thrust of that plan so often is lived out in the life of the church. Now hear me, I don't believe that everyone is called to be in vocational ministry or to be part of a church staff or to be a pastor. That's not what I'm saying. Because I believe I'm, at, I'm married to a woman who absolutely has been called throughout her life to be a teacher somehow, some way. She has made such an incredible difference in the lives of her students. I don't know so many of you have a calling, a vocational calling upon your life. But I've also found I've also found when we follow God's call upon our lives, when we follow that purpose that God has in our lives, it almost is always lived out in the life of the church. It's almost always lived out in the life of the church. And so God has a purpose, and God has a plan in your life, and I believe, I believe that you very well may be that missing piece of our puzzle here at Polk Street. Now, I I know, I know being a pastor for as long as I've been, I know some of you are thinking to yourself, well, pastor, you don't know my unique situation. I, 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 I can't become involved. I'm too old. I'm too busy. And the excuses go on and on and on. Some may think, well, I could, I could never, ever do that. I would challenge you to go back, go back and read the story of Moses and his call. <laughs> How God called him and Moses said, oh, I could never, ever do that. And I can promise you, as an 18-year-old boy, that was my exact response to God's call upon my life. God, I could never, ever do that. God, you don't understand how shy I am. God, you just don't understand and he called me anyway. And I believe that God is calling you as well. When Bishop Nunn contacted me about four months ago and and asked me, well, he didn't necessarily ask me, he said, (laughs) he said that you'll be appointed to Polk Street United Methodist Church. No, actually, he he did give me a choice. He said two things about Polk Street. He said, you need to know two things about Polk Street. One, Polk Street needs to grow. Polk Street needs to grow. Polk Street needs to reach more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The second thing you need to know is Polk Street needs to grow younger. 
And we recognize that. I've heard that from so many of you. Hear me now, church. I believe that that piece of the puzzle that you are, part of what we are about at Polk Street is you. You belong. Every single one of us belong. Every single one of us make a difference. All of us together, when we complete this beautiful puzzle of this magnificent church of of Polk Street, and we are following God's call upon our lives as a church, no doubt, there is no doubt in my mind, we will grow and we will reach the young. Sisters and brothers, there is There are people slipping into eternity moment by moment by moment without knowing the love of God through Jesus Christ. Our ultimate purpose is to share the good news of Jesus Christ with this community and around the world. And you have a part to play in that. God has a purpose in your life. God has a call upon your life. Would you bow with me? Oh God, we thank you for this call that you have placed in our lives. Oh God, no doubt, no doubt, some of us here today are, we're using our gifts and graces for our own good. We're storing up treasures here on earth. We're putting our time and our effort into things that are temporal. But Lord, you have asked us to serve you. You have asked us to follow your purpose and your plan in our lives. Oh God, help us to not just use our piece of the puzzle for ourselves, but help us to use that piece of our puzzle for you in your kingdom. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There may be some of you here today that have felt a call upon your life. It may indeed may be a, a call to full-time vocational ministry. Never, never, never count out that God may have something very, very special for you in the life of the church. It may be that you have felt a a, a stirring inside of your soul, and you want to be part, more part of what we're doing here at Polk Street and what God has planned for us. If you need to come forward and pray at the altar and, and maybe just simply make a commitment today that you're going to follow God no matter where He calls you, wherever He leads you. It may be today that you are here and you'd like to take a step of membership here at Polk Street either by making a profession of faith for the first time or transferring your membership. You found us to be a kind of place that you want to be part of. We would invite you to come forward. I would love to visit with you more about that decision. So please stand, if you would, as we join together in singing our hymn of invitation.